I am Shonda Buchanan, and today I'm the face of America. We have to keep saying to our youth, uh, American Indian and African American, that this is your country. This is our country. We're not going anywhere. My name is Shonda Buchanan. I am a professor and an author. I am the author of the new memoir, Black Indian. I've been a professor at the university level for about 17 or 18 years, teaching everything from composition to senior seminar, critical theory, uh, women's literature, ethnic lit, African American literature. Uh, so the gamut, uh, in fact. I was born in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Kalamazoo, Michigan is uh, what we call a blink and you miss it town. So basically it's a small town. Um, but I was raised with the, the sentiments and the sentimentality of the Midwestern lifestyle. My mother and her sisters grew up on a farm in Matawan, Michigan. Uh, they had horses and cows and pigs and all those things. They didn't have running water in their house when they were growing up, so they had an outhouse. Uh, and a lot of people don't think about how that Midwestern area is basically the area of settlers. Um, people built their own houses, uh, their own homes. And even though they were little bitty houses, you know, they were farmers, they were settlers. They basically were trying to eke out a living uh, you know, in those, um, not homesteads, but just in those little plots of land that they had. As a mixed blood woman, someone who considers herself African American with American Indian roots, and also someone who is, uh, has, you know, I have white and Europe, European in me as well, so I consider myself triracial. So the, the real value that my mother instilled in me is that I'm human, right? Is that I have the right to be on the same playing field uh, as everyone else, as a person who shares the same blood running through my veins. I think it was really important for my mom, even though she didn't actually say it, she didn't say, you should consider yourself as, as good as anyone in this society, as good as anyone in this world. But she would always say, I know what I have in me, but I consider myself a human being first. And I chose to become a writer first because I loved language and I love literature. I love storytelling. I love how stories can propel you and take you to a whole nother world. And then they also grow you up, right? And then I think I decided to become a scholar after because I wanted to immerse myself in storytelling on all levels. And there is a story in research. You know, there is a story in scholarship. There are some multiple stories in scholarship. But I also wanted to teach my students the importance of storytelling and then also how language can empower you. I feel just like James Baldwin when someone asked him, an interviewer asked him, you were born black you're gay, you were born in poverty. How do you feel? And James Baldwin said, I hit the jackpot. <laughs> and I feel like I hit the jackpot as a mixed blood in the society. I do feel like it is my responsibility to tell the true story of America and to talk about that tapestry that is hidden. So I do feel like, um, I do feel like it is my mission to talk about what it means to be someone who at the cusp of this country as a child of the enslaved Africans and that's important because people say slaves as if they had no agency as if they had no country before they came here and so I say enslaved Africans who met and married Europeans who met and married or had children with, if they didn't marry the Europeans, the American Indians, uh, however those intersections happened. And I feel like it is my responsibility to celebrate and to sing 
the stories of those mixed bloods or free people of color or the mulatto or whatever those names were that they developed to relabel us and recategorize us for their own comfort, I think it's my mission to tell that story. The story of the American Indian is so complex in, in our society. And because I represent that intersection, I have to talk about both, both ethnicities that were um, shared the oppression you know, um, in, our, in our society in America for so long. American Indians have um, a trauma that they are suffering from. And one of the reasons that they probably still, or we probably still kind of keep to ourselves is because we want to hang on to the tradition that we have left. <laughs> so we want to hang on to our songs and our stories and our culture. Uh, also, um, we want to hang on to our children, you know. We want to uh, make sure that we are teaching them our, our narratives and what happened to us in the past. And I will say that when I say trauma, the story of the American Indian is the French Indian War, right? 400 years, 500 years of since the first, oh gosh, uh, 1505, Hispanola, you know, when the Spaniards came over and started enslaving, enslaving the indigenous population, right, in those islands. So from 1505 to, gosh, when the first <sighs> Trail of Tears, we'll go there, 1828, 1830, when the five civilized tribes represented the last um, of the removal, the Indian removal, or the great uh, trail where they cried, right? This is what other American Indian tribes call the great remo removal. So that trauma of the fighting, the trauma of the encroachment, the trauma of being murdered, the trauma of being relegated to third class citizen, not just second class citizen in the society, um, of being less than, of having your tribe, tribal names stripped from you to a point where in the U.S. Census, American Indians were called other, right? So that is the relabeling of you as an ethnic person in this society, just taking away your sovereignty, right? And so even though we, American Indians, still have our reservations, you know, which were relegated to us, you know, uh, we were put on those. And then we still have our, our language in some, some societies, actually, a lot of the languages are disappearing. Um, but we still have a sense of tradition and culture. And I think it's probably difficult to find a scholar to talk about that because an American Indian person is one person from one tribe when there were over 500 tribes in this country at the beginning, quote unquote, beginning of America. Because there is still the sense, unless you are a part of it and unless you know that American Indians don't exist in America, then it, it will continue to be a bit of a struggle to get the youth um, to to become a part of American politics. They don't believe American politics represents them. And reservation life is incredibly hard and difficult. Uh, American Indian women are the most murdered women in our country. American Indian women are the most raped and abused women in our country. Um, behind African American women who are uh, the most likely to die from uh, domestic abuse, right? So the politics on the reservation, um, the, the disparity on reservations, the suicide rate on reservations uh, is catastrophic. And because they're still dealing with the trauma of encroachment and settlers taking their land and um, pushing them into Indian territory, it's incredibly hard to see yourself as a politician or someone who can make a change and a difference in, in your world, in your society.